So I already started the recording, so it'll notify them when they get in um, about that it's being recorded. Some people like to have their videos off, so I will remember to say that. Welcome, thank you for joining us. We are going to let um, everyone sign on, give everybody a couple of minutes before we get started, but we appreciate you being here um, on a very nice fall day. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. A couple housekeeping things before we get started. Um, you all are muted. We can't see you. So um, some people worry about that, especially if they're on a cell phone. I know that we have a couple of people calling in on a cell phone. Um, we will have some question and answer time. So there at the bottom of the Zoom screen will be a Q&A area um, that you can put questions in as we share our information tonight. Um, and we will be recording. It should have told you that as you signed on, but our hope is to make a resource library for our parents uh, to support their students. And so we would like to add this to that. Since it's 631, we will go ahead and get started. I'm Christy Berger. I'm the Director of School Counseling and Mental Health for Center Grove Schools. And we are so excited to kick off our first uh, parent series that we have had, um, and the first one being tonight. And so I am going to have Sarah Campbell um, really give us some background about what those series will look like, and then we will get started with our time. Hello, everyone. So um, as Christy said, my name is Sarah Campbell. I'm the Crisis and Family Liaison for Center Grove School Corporation. Um, so um, we're kicking off this series, really excited to get started. We've seen some parents um, interested in some support for mental health. So we created this series to provide that extra support to parents. Um, it's a three session series. Um, this one, obviously we're focusing, focusing on stress versus anxiety. Um, and then the next ones will focus on bullying and depression. And then our last one at the end of the year, we'll talk more about how to have a safe summer. So we're really excited. We've partnered with Vala Vista um, to um, help provide this information for everyone. And so we have Susan here who I'll let introduce herself um, and she'll get us started. All right, thank you, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Uh, so just a few quick snippet about me. Uh, like Sarah said, I do work at Valley Vista. I am an adolescent IOP therapist. Uh, we're one of our programs that so we have groups for adults and adolescents. And my group kids come for short terms to have a little increased support from like maybe a little higher than one-on-one -on -one, uh, because they're struggling in their daily functioning in life. I'm also not just a therapist, but a supervisor for the adolescent outpatient program. And so one of the things that I'm passionate about is connecting with the with the community, right? I um, oftentimes by the time kids get to me in group, they've been going through a, a fair amount of stuff, and so I think it's so important to also provide resources and ideas and supports in a very proactive way, right? Uh, and perhaps tonight I can give you guys some ideas and some tools to support your kids. Um, Let's see. So I we're going to get started with the big. The title is stress versus anxiety, right? Like how can you tell when it moves from a healthy level of stress, which is natural, we all have it, to something that's a little bit more harmful uh, and to a kind of more of a chronic issue with anxiety? Because uh, sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference. Uh, first, before we get to our first handout, because it's not in the handout, but it, the two systems, just a little bit of background information, there's two systems in our, in our body. There is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, right? One is our stress response, right? So when we have a stress 
stressful situation, some sort of trigger, internal or external, that gets activated and adrenaline or epinephrine gets flooded into our system, right? That causes the stress response in our bodies. Uh, and so we might feel some physiological effects, right? Our breathing starts to get rapid, our heartbeat kind of is going, uh, you know, we might have an increased like burst of energy, which and we'll get to when stress is helpful here in a second, but that increased energy, heart rate, breathing uh, can, if you're sitting in you know, a table ready for a test, that can be a lot to handle, right? And you can turn very quickly into anxiety and something that's not helpful. The other system, our, our parasympathetic system, System is kind of our rest and relax, right? That is something our body naturally does after a threat has passed or been resolved. Uh, although sometimes we need a little help getting it going. I will also give you some ideas for that. Uh, and so I guess our first handout, if you didn't get those on the email, is I'm so stressed out, right? This is from the National Institute of Mental Health. And then I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit, uh, but it has some really great points in here. Uh, it, it identifies stress as the physical or mental response to an external cause, right? Maybe there was a really loud noise, or there was an upcoming test or exam, or a job interview, uh, you know, a whole lot of homework, finals, those sorts of things, right? M most of us are going to have a stress response to that, right? Uh, and for stress to be a help helpful, healthy thing, as it can be, it can increase our focus, it can increase our motivation, uh, and it can also um, you know, help improve alertness, right? Of course, stress in small doses, short term, is when it can be healthy and helpful. When we get to uh, trouble is when it's a little bit more chronic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and so with anxiety, your body's reaction to stress can occur even if there is no current threat, right? Uh, whereas regular kind of everyday stress, there's an external trigger usually for anxiety. It could be external, but there's oftentimes triggered by an internal uh, situation going on and does not dissipate as your, your everyday stress would do. So in this little graph, I love graphs because it just kind of breaks it down to the main points. Uh, you know, as it says, stress is an external cause usually. Uh, goes away when the situation is resolved. Uh, can be positive. Uh, a couple other ways that this stress can be positive is uh, when we go through stressful situations and we utilize our supports, it can increase uh, not only our performance and in our individual growth, but also our bonding with other people. If you think about uh, you know, a partner or a friend, if you've gone through a stressful situation, you supported each other, you're actually closer. So that stressful situation and outcome is a very positive one. Also, stressful situations, a uh, good thing to reinforce with kids, it is an, an opportunity for growth. Right. Uh, when things are tough, when you things aren't coming easy, uh, it's the idea of resilience, which is we'll get to a little bit later and I'll give you some more ideas of how to foster and grow resilience. Um, but that is you know, we can't unfortunately. Fortunately, unfortunately, we can't protect the kids from stress all the time. Um, with support of you, learning how to handle that in a healthy way is really, really helpful and really, really vital for them to become healthy adults. All right. Uh, so the both stress and anxiety, of course, uh, is you know, maybe excessive worry, right? Something we kind of rehash it in our brain, something I call it the what if game. I, I think about in the future, what if that happens? What if that happened? Usually it's the worst case scenario. Again, stress response gets triggered, right? Because what we imagine uh, is really what our body's responding to. It can't tell the difference, right? Uh, we have a sense of unease. Maybe we have some physical re responses, right? Sometimes with you know day-to-day -day stress, we have an upset stomach or headaches or you know tight muscles and so forth. Maybe we don't sleep very well. When we start to get over into that anxiety, more unhealthy sort of thing, uh, again, kind of an internal trigger to stress. Uh, maybe there's a thought, maybe there's a memory, uh, maybe there's just a sensation for some people. And it's a persistent, it's an ongoing sense of unease or apprehension, right? It's excessive worry. Uh, and as the handout says, a dread as well. Sometimes we're so much dreading what's going to happen in the future. Again, we're kind of imagining those things and that stress response is kind of going haywire uh, and is not necessarily dependent on a, a, a immediate stress, right? Uh, immediate trigger, immediate danger. So going down 
around a little bit, if you would, Sarah or Christy. Okay, so uh, about learn, helping our kids learn how to manage their stress. Let's just start the regular everyday things. I am, you know, as a therapist and I, whether someone's in group with me or even my own choices, I always encourage uh, this, this proactive approach, right? So things with coping with stress and anxiety, I call them the building blocks of our mood, right? So healthy sleep, healthy eating, you know, staying social and staying active all very, very important things. There's more things, of course, but those are the big four. It also suggests being very aware of the caffeine intake. If the, someone's prone to a lot of stress and anxiety, caffeine will increase that a whole bunch. Uh, you know, exercise is part of being active. Uh, it's a great way to burn off some of that excess stress. People who exercise on the semi-regular are better able to manage stressors as they come up without being consumed by them. Uh, also has on this handout, uh, identifying and challenging negative or unhealthy, helpful thinking. Oftentimes kids need help with this, right? Uh, they say things to themselves so frequently uh, that they, they believe it, right? And so sometimes they need some assistance from their supports to kind of think, you know, examine, okay, what is going on here? Uh, a couple of, you know, options or a couple of things that often come up with the teenagers I work with are, is perfectionism, right? They have a very big fear of failure, of letting people down, right? They're high performers. And so some great way support, you know, them with it challenging some faulty thinking is, you know, um, I'm a cheesy therapist. I always say, so I have all the sayings, right? So perfect is the enemy of good, right? Um, doing your best is really important. And, you know, a lot of times with your teens, they may be having some of this faulty thinking or the stress or the fear of failure, and they might not tell you, not because you're not there for them, not because you're not great supports for them, but because they're teenagers. And sometimes they fear failure. Sometimes they fear disappointing you. Uh, and that if they admit that they're struggling or they admit that, hey, I'm getting super stressed out, I'm not sure what to do, they, it's hard for them to admit, right? Because they their, their vision or their view is that everyone else has it kind of figured out. Uh, so it's something just to kind of keep in mind, you know, being available is wonderful. Kind of checking in, also awesome. Another big stressor and anxiety trigger uh, for a lot of teenagers is kind of the go, 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 right? Kind of that constant effort, that constant um, involvement. And not that that's bad to be busy and involved with a lot of things. It's actually really great. Uh, but it's important to help our kids learn and understand how to start activating their parasympathetic system, right? If kids don't get breaks or rests, eventually they're going to burn out. And so sometimes you will see this externally, right? You know, and have schools have breaks, right? For this very reason, but also helping them know, hey, it's okay to have maybe a Saturday or an afternoon where where you rest a little bit. Um, and also modeling this is also a really great idea too. Some of these things that I'm encouraging and I'm teaching the teenagers, there are things as adults we can do as well. And so um, the big third thing before we move on to our next, or I'm pausing for questions here in a second, are normalizing mistakes, right? The fear of failure for our teens are so big that uh, they, they don't realize, even if you teach them that and you show them that, that it's okay to make mistakes, right? That that's actually an opportunity for growth and learning. And that's getting into that idea of resilience. How do we handle when things don't go well? Um, and so that is, again, I'm going to give you some more ideas on that here in a moment. Um, it does part of your handout to kind of give some suggestions. When do you, when do you know maybe your kid needs a little extra help, right? Uh, so the big thing with anxiety, the big warning sign is when it starts to affect someone's ability to function in day-to-day -day living, right? So if the anxiety or stress is getting in the way of someone enjoying activities, uh, going out in social situations, um, you know, lack of sleep, right? Uh, that is a big red flag that maybe I need to talk to my school counselor, maybe my pediatrician, you know, of services out there uh, and some emergency ones here at the bottom of course so i guess i do um real quick before we move into like kind of ideas about resilience uh, are there any questions i don't know sometimes i get talking and i, I kind of just keep going so i don't see any questions but i i have a couple wonderings um yes kind of from our viewpoint as we work with our center growth families. Um, so stress and anxiety comes up a lot for our students K yes. through 12. And sometimes um, it appears to be um, internal. Sometimes it's external pressures mm -hmm. that our students are feeling, whether that's extracurriculars, whether that's, you know, friendships or things of that nature. Um, and I wonder in your work, Susan, 
how you kind of handle those internal, like our kids who really internalize all of that versus kids who have external stress mm -hmm. factors and how, how we might support the students who have those internal, it's easy to say with outside factors, you know, sure. take a break, walk away, maybe don't mm -hmm. involve yourself in all of those extracurriculars and all of those AP classes, like those external factors, we can kind of help students narrow down. But I think it's mm -hmm. that internal part uh, that we see a lot of in Center Grove. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of internalizing with anxiety. Uh, and so once we get here to kind of that resilience too, I think a lot of that is internal thought process and perceptions, right, of themselves, of expectations. And so um, fostering as resilience here in a second that we'll discuss, I think those internalizers, um, you, well, of course, they're teenagers trying to help them open up and talk about what are their thought process, what is stressing them out, what are their expectations for themselves. You know, sometimes I have, well, actually, quite often I'll have kids who, you know, I'll, I'll ask them and like, oh, so where's all this pressure to be perfect coming from, right? And is it like, you know, like people say this to you and they're like, no. And they kind of get kind of what boils down to that they have those expectations, those unrealistic expectations for themselves, right? And so a lot of our high performing kids have this, right? Because that's, that's, strive for perfection and that internalizing of that go, go, go is, uh, has some success with it, right? They do well, they get good grades, they accomplish things. And so it builds, it builds a false sense of this is the healthy thing for me to do. Uh, and so I think aiding kids to realize, hey, you know, you are not defined by your performance, so to speak, right? Like who you are as a person, your human worth is defined by so many more things, right? Uh, school's important, you know, like, but you know, the, the accomplishments, those things are wonderful. But I think helping kids to understand, because I don't think that is something, even though us as adults know that, um, we don't always communicate that and sometimes there's a false understanding um, of their, their self-worth. You know, hard enough to be a teenager, especially in this day and age, but add in those pressures and that, that, that desire to succeed um, can kind of tip the scales. Wonderful. Um, something else that I know parents might hear at home is um, in some of our guidance classroom lessons that our counselors do, or even in some small groups, um, our kids do with our counselors. We talk a lot about toxic stress. So we talk about how stress is normal and it helps us when we're waiting till the very end, um, we're procrastinating, right? That stress helps to kick us into gear. Um, mm -hmm. but that toxic stress is where we really have those effects on our body. And we talk a lot to our students about that could be a variety of things from, I'm not sure, you know, what's going on at home, if there's a, you know, parents arguing, some financial situations, all the way to friendships that are that toxic ongoing. Um, and so just wanted to point that out for parents who are on the call that we use that language a lot, kind of helping kids know the difference between stress and toxic stress. Absolutely. And that's a great way to word it, right? To normalize the stress response, right? Because some kids too are like, oh no, I shouldn't be this stressed, right? <laughs> you know, like everyone else has it together, but you know, what's going on with me? So thank you for that. Yeah. All right. uh, and so, you know, 10 ways to build resilience and resilience, of course, is their ability to recover or adapt to difficult things that happen, right? We all know it's going to happen, uh, even though we, we would like to protect our kids from experiencing kind of difficulties. Hopefully we understand that as they're growing up and when they're teenagers is the best time for them to experience some challenges so that you can be there to support them to understand how to deal with that, right? Because uh, we, you know, in life, they're going to have ups and downs and challenges. Uh, so the first one that helps build that is a big proactive thing is, is having healthy connections, right? Uh, so having a you know, supportive family environment, family can be immediate family, can be extended family, uh, can be anyone can consider like a healthy family, healthy adult individual, uh, also healthy peers. And that's a hard one, you know, we always try to support our kids in making healthy choices when it comes to who they choose as friends. Um, but the healthy connections, if I know I, I other people care about me and value me. Again, I know that I'm not, if I experience, uh, you know, a mistake or a failure or things don't go according to plan, I know I'm not a horrible person, right? It's going to be hard, but I know that I still have value and there's people there to help me through it. Uh, number two is helping others. Uh, again, with busy schedules, you know, sometimes there may or may not be time for actual, like, 
like scheduled volunteer opportunities, if there is wonderful, right? Uh, helping others helps build empathy, right? It helps make us kind of have that connection with others, something bigger than ourselves. Uh, but also helping at home, helping, you know, just random acts of kindness, I always encourage. You know, how we treat others is really important. Uh, it's maintaining a daily routine as much as possible. <laughs> Life is busy for most of us and there's lots of things and lots of schedules can change and that's completely understandable. But if you have a basic schedule that you always come back to, sleep cycle, when trying to have meals, you know, maybe at least a couple times as a family, maybe more of that if it's possible, uh, schedule downtime, kind of rest time, having that daily routine, it can, is easier to do things because you always do it than trying to create something new from scratch every single day. Uh, and kids need that consistency. You know, they need to know what to expect because that makes them feel safe so that they can focus on some other things. Uh, check in. You know, always can be a challenge when you are working with your junior high, high school kids. Uh, they start to become more of an individual. And so they might like resist, you know, those check-ins. But the mere fact that you're trying is valuable, right? And a lot of these things, you know, a lot of times I'll get kids in group and they will be like, I'll, I'll share some stuff with them and they'll be like, Oh, that's what my mom said, right? You know, so they hear you. They do hear you, even if they pretend they don't or they think that it's ridiculous or whatever. What you say, what you do, the support you provide is incredibly valuable. Um, they just may not let you know it until they're adults. Uh, so that check-in of like, hey, how's it going? Just kind of on a, a, as a routine sort of thing. Or if you notice things are kind of like, you know, they're worried, they're upset. Um, be available, right? Uh, if they are open to some feedback and sometimes they might just want you to listen and that is still being supportive, but if they are open and sometimes it's helpful to ask, be like, hey, I, you know, gosh, normalize their feelings. Hey, this is what's going on. But also, are you open to my feedback right now? Um, to avoid maybe them being a little upset in the moment. Uh, I have some ideas, right? Uh, focusing on something that they can control, especially when it comes to stress and anxiety, we worry about a lot of things that are completely outside of our control, what other people think, you know, the future. And so if you can help them kind of refocus, it's okay to feel that and worry about that, right? We all do. But if you can help them refocus on, okay, so for in the here and now, today or tomorrow, what can I do to make it better or work in the direction I want it to be? When we're focused on what we can control, which is basically ourselves, we feel better. It's healthy action. Uh, Self-care, I kind of mentioned those building blocks, you know, our eating, our sleeping, our exercise, hygiene, of course, um, which also can be a struggle, I know, for kids. Uh, but those, that we the better we take care of our physical bodies, the better our ability to manage stress. I mean, lots of times our, <laughs> you know, being hangry or when we're tired, we're not going to handle our mood. Things are going to be like seem way bigger than they would otherwise. Also, I added in there enjoyable activities. Part of our self-care is doing the things that we like to do. Uh, so very important. Um, move towards goals, right? Uh, so sometimes, especially our high achiever kids, they are very goal oriented. They have these big, wonderful goals they're working towards, but they get so overwhelmed, right? And so helping them break it down to kind of bite-sized pieces uh, is really, really helpful. You know, with maybe if they something happened, they're behind on homework. Okay, how much... Can you get done in this day? Like, how much time do you realistically have to spend on this? Uh, and and a lot of these things too, depending on the its age level, right? The younger kids need a lot more kind of guidance and teaching in this. But um, as they get older, also allowing them to maybe problem solve or encourage them to kind of throw out their ideas first. If they have them, great. You can kind of help elaborate that and guide. Um, and sometimes they might need a little bit more directive kind of suggestions. Uh, these next couple are, 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 well, they're all important, but these are important as well. Uh, the nurture a positive sense of self. Again, uh, that we, the self-worth for our kids is so difficult. I mean, being a teenager is hard enough, right? But with all the different influences and things they see, um, they struggle with uh, having a healthy sense of who they are, right? Uh, and so the this explains, even goes further, uh, 
encourage and reinforce, point out, praise those times that they overcame obstacles. I think a lot of us, myself included, like we, it's a natural, like positive reinforcement that we give about like, oh my gosh, you look so nice today, right? Or, hey, you know, you're, you're so smart, you know, that's great or good grades. Those are great, right? I'm not saying don't do those. But I think that sometimes, again, that ties into a kid's sense of worth of like, okay, I, my sense of worth is with these things, how I look. Um, my achievements, you know, the good things that I do. But if you see a kid and they have overcome a really rough patch, right? Or they, oh my gosh, you had so many things scheduled this week, you know, from sports to like, you know, family stuff to, you know, grades, that kind of thing. And man, it was really tough, but you got through it. I was really impressed with your ability to do that. You know, reinforcing problem solving and the idea of resilience, overcoming obstacles, it helps them understand, ah, like I, I'm doing great. Like I'm going to have this tough stuff that happens, but if I uh, doing good gets kind of, re, you know, changed a little bit, the idea that even though I struggle, me doing my best to handle it, um, that's still really great. Um, keep perspective and a hopeful outlook, something maybe we all can use and support on. Uh, sometimes we get so much in the moment that we're so overwhelmed by emotions, teenagers time tens that we kind of lose the big picture. And so helping kids when, you know, maybe we're not in the middle of a huge emotion, but helping remind them, hey, is this going to matter in, you know, a week, a month, a year, 10 years? You know, it's really, it's a big deal right now. I get that. We don't want to devalue their emotional reaction. Um, but hey, right now is not forever, right? Things have a way of changing. The only constant in life is change, right? So when things are really great, we try to savor that and enjoy that. But when they're rough, we also know that's going to change too. Uh, a couple more here. I think it see tough times as opportunities for growth and uh, learning from our mistakes. Emphasize what can be learned for the future, how that's going to help us. There is a wonderful quote from Michael Jordan. And working with kids, I always have to like make sure, do you know who Michael Jordan is? Um, luckily, most of them do, which makes me, me happy. Um, but even if they don't, I explain it. Uh, there's a couple, wonderful quote about how many free throws he missed and how many game-winning shots you know, went off to the side. Uh, and he goes through all this list of things, you know, like failures. But at the end, it's like, but this is why I succeed. You know, I learned from this. This helped me grow. This helped me be passionate um, to go further. And so that's it's kind of that idea that I try to translate to kids of like, hey, uh, sometimes the people who, you know, struggle or mess up the most are the ones who are the most successful because they keep trying new things. They keep going. They learn so much. Uh, and then accept change hard for all of us. Once again, change being that natural thing that we we fear, it's uncomfortable, um, but can be such an opportunity for us to connect with new ideas, new skills, uh, new things that we enjoy. Uh, and so helping them understand, yes, it's tough, but this is what's going to help things you know, improve, get better, and progress. So. All right, I'm getting through here fast. Uh, any, Christy, any questions? Nope, it doesn't look like we have any yet. Okay, all right. Again, just, just check in with everybody. Uh, and so, again, so that, is, and so resilience, how do I recover? How, these are proactive things that if I'm working on these, I'm going to be better prepared and able to handle the tough stuff that happens, right? All right. Uh, and then the last handout that I have is, is really kind of some more specific ideas. And, you know, of course, feel free to share these with the kids. I think it's um, kind of like coping skills kind of ideas, but they're kind of broken down in some different areas. You know, uh, sometimes I teach it just as a useful thing to remember is STAR, right? Stop, think, and react. And so we, uh, lots of times when we get those external or internal triggers to our stress or anxiety, uh, especially when we're teenagers, we feel we react, right? We don't have that thinking part in there. And that usually leads to some pretty unhealthy things, you know, because we're not thinking about consequences long-term and so forth. And so initial skills um, are to stop. How if I'm in a 10 out of 10 of like worry or sadness or, you know, whatever that is, my first order of business is to calm myself down so I can think clearly. None of us can think clearly when we're at a nine or 10 out of 10. 
And so some of those skills that help us you know, activate that parasympathetic system, right? That's kind of what we talked about earlier, that rest and relax response is our, you know, maybe there's breathing skills, maybe doing something um, to distract the brain. Like in here it has, I'll explain a couple of these um, uh, name colors, right? Not, not give them new names, but like looking around the room, like, oh, uh, you can't see my room. The blinds are black. And my this tree is green. My yoga mat is purple. You know, it's a little bit of a distraction for the brain, right? Thoughts equal our emotions. So if we can push pause or a reset button on our thoughts, so what we're focusing on, we start to activate that parasympathetic parasympathetic response, the rest and relax, and we calm down enough to start thinking clearly. Uh, other things that do this too, alphabet backwards, for me, that probably would get frustrating. I wouldn't get very far, I don't think. Uh, a mantra, a word or phrase that we can repeat over and over, this too shall pass, it's gonna be okay. Um, those sorts of things. Sometimes I'll have them pick a, like the word peace, right? Uh, or a, a lyric from a song or a poem. Uh, breathing skills are super big on that. Again, when we practice breathing skills, side note, I'm a certified yoga instructor on the side and something that I use every day. Uh, when we take purposeful, long, deep breaths, that activates our parasympathetic you know, nervous system. It helps us calm down. Our heart rate starts to drop. It slows. Right? Uh, so the think part. So part of this is naming, maybe we're naming emotions, right? There is, it's helpful if you know, when we, instead of feeling so overwhelmed by the, what we're feeling, when we can name an emotion, I'm feeling worried, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling sad. There's something that unlocks in our brain that allows us to be able to move to problem solving much faster. Like, okay, this is what I'm feeling, then okay, like, what can I do to handle that, right? So I always encourage, even though I know cheesy therapist, uh, people will be able to name their emotion or, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a mix of several. Uh, and then, okay, what are my options, right? Maybe that's the problem solving what can I do to make this better? Or if there's nothing I can do to make it better, something happened in the past or something that's outside of our control, how do I move forward, right? Uh, and so as I kind of go and then react, choose the one that's gonna be best for you or the ones, sometimes there's multiples. So this list of coping skills, uh, first ones are mood boosters, just things you know, in the moment that can help us feel better. You know, um, sometimes inspirational things, uh, pets, right? <laughs> Again, you can, we, if we think about the things that help like those little feel good chemicals in our system, uh, you know, a, a hug from a loved one, watching a cute cat video, um, music is pretty universal, right? Uh, if a lot of kids are very artistic and so being able to connect them with painting, drawing, um, coloring, whatever, whatever that is, it helps them feel good. Uh, the, um, some movement, you know, we'll go for a walk, do yoga. Uh, I'm a little partial. I, the gratitude list uh, is a big one because I think that's, you know, it is, I guess, tis the season as Thanksgiving's coming up. Uh, and maybe some of us have that you know, tradition where we go around and everyone says something that they're thankful for, which I always think is kind of neat. Um, but if we can teach our kids to uh, make a semi-regular practice of gratitude, uh, whether it's I'm grateful, you know, for, you know, this that went well today, or I, you know, noticing their successes, it helps them handle the tough stuff a little bit more, because I know we have a tendency to notice all the things that didn't go well, that we don't have, and so just making a regular practice of saying, hey, this went well, this was a success, I completed the school, awesome, it gets a little bit more focus on our brain. Uh, the basic needs again, right? Uh, you know, if I'm getting upset and really irritable, did I? Do I need a snack? Did I? Do I need a nap? A healthy nap? We don't want to sleep all day. Uh, am I dehydrated? A lot of kids end up being very dehydrated, right? If they're drinking sodas or they're very active, you know, in their school day, a lot don't think to stop and you know make sure they're drinking uh, healthy fluids, right? Uh, processing feelings. And so uh, this may or may not involve you, right? If it can, that's awesome. Um, but if they have another healthy adult, uh, it, if your kid is willing to process and talk about their thoughts and feelings with someone else, that's not a rejection of you. Uh, they may just worry about disappointing you, stressing you out. But if they are talking with a healthy individual, that's good, right? That they're learning, they're letting things out in a healthy way so they don't build up and they're getting positive reinforcement and suggestions. Um, happens a lot, guys. Uh, so some of the other things, processing feelings, you know, I teach the kids having a good cry, it's a natural release, right? Um, you know, again, expressive things. Uh, journaling, um, you know, 
and there are lots of other things that we can do there. Writing a letter, right? Uh, problem solving. All right. So this, and this is the part too where you might step in a little bit is brainstorming possible solutions, right? Um, you know, what can what can I do to make this better? Right? Decrease focus on what I can't control. We kind of talked about that one. All right. And I think there's another page of this one. Nope. Uh, we're back to the volunteering, which we talked about, doing something nice, compliment others. I will say if uh, sometimes we have kiddos who are very heavily invested in helping others. And I always try to help them understand that there's <laughs> any healthy skill can be overused, right? Some kids and maybe some adults too, get so focused on helping others and taking care of others. They get kind of this caregiver role that they don't do anything to take care of themselves. And so sometimes they um, they see that from us, you know, as parents, lots of times you're focused on your kids and maybe you aren't taking, you know, you're, you're not the focus of yourself and that self-care is so vital uh, for the long-term, but helping kids understand helping others wonderful, but you also have to treat yourself with as much kindness, love, and support as you give others. Uh, more relaxation techniques, right? And, you know, these are, these are ideas that I've listed. There's so many more out there. The breathing skills, of course, uh, you know, progressive muscle relaxation. There's a lot of videos and things out there that can walk you through some of these, these activities, which are great, even yoga, uh, you know, guided meditation, of course, reading if that's their thing or your thing, um, back to music, uh, it does say unplug. I think taking a media break is always a good idea, no matter what age you are. We just kind of get sucked in and there's kind of this passive viewing of lots of messages and things. Uh, I'm not completely against it, but I think that uh, we all could use a break sometimes. And practicing mindfulness or grounding skills. And so those, if you're not familiar, are um, skills that help us kind of focus and bring us back to this moment. A lot of our stress and anxiety is about the future, those what is, right? Uh, and sometimes our mood is heavily impacted by our shoulda, coulda, what is stuff from the past. And so when we notice we're going in one of these directions, I teach to find some of these breathing techniques or these grounding techniques, you know, going through my senses, noticing five things that are always there that I don't always notice, right? So maybe I can feel the chair below me supporting my body. Maybe I can feel the sleeves of my, you know, my shirt on my arms. Uh, if I stop talking for a minute, I can hear the buzzing of the lights above me. Uh, you know, I have, you know, maybe the taste of the bottled water, you know, going through all those five senses. Because when I'm focusing on that, I'm not thinking of all those thoughts that are making me more and more upset. It's kind of control out delete for the brain, and then I can begin again asking for help. I think you're really, um, that's a big one that teens really struggle with. Again, with the asking, admitting they need help and asking for it. There's a lot of kind of baggage that goes with that. And so normalizing, even for ourselves as adults, you know, hey, like sometimes, you know, we, you know, we are made stronger and more successful by utilizing our supports doesn't mean anything bad about us it's not a weakness to ask for help there's wisdom there you know uh, as humans we're not built to do all this by ourselves uh, and uh, help can look different too sometimes it is that feedback and problem solving and sometimes it's just being there and listening and then the very end, I did add some therapeutic apps. There's a lot of like uh, apps out there that uh, help teach mindfulness and grounding skills, some kind of maybe relaxation skills. Um, and uh, I don't, I'm not, I don't stock in any of these. I'm not making any money. Uh, this is just some of the ones that I looked up and there's many, many more out there, right? Some do cost money, some are free. I think a lot of these are, at least have a free version uh, of what, so you can kind of check it out if you're at all interested. And so the therapeutic apps and a lot of these skills, honestly, these are things to do when we're early feeling stressed and also great proactive things we can do uh, so our stress doesn't build up. Remember that we have that sympathetic stress response parasympathetic. Uh, so when, if we are proactively activating that parasympathetic rest and relax response, we're dealing, we're letting go of some of that stress that can build up. And we're also teaching ourselves to go to that rest and relax much faster in stressful situations. We're able to drop back down into that. Uh, whereas when we have chronic stress or we have history of, you know, some trauma, uh, we're constantly doing that stress response, right? Uh, and then it's like, it's, it's kind of like a, a light switch, right? It's, it's kind of stuck on 
uh, and then eventually that gets too exhausting and gets stuck off, right? So the rest relax and we have no energy, right? And so being able to um, activate, you know, that rest and relax helps us manage the stress so it's not chronic and ongoing. All right. Oh, I think we have a question. I see a little thing pop up. We do. Okay. Do you want me to read it to you, Susan? Is that easy? Yes. Oh, um, I guess I can click on it. Can I? Um, I think I got it. Okay. Uh, how do we help motivate our teens who do struggle with anxiety to do their best? Because it really matters in terms of limiting their future opportunities without stressing them out. <laughs> it's it's kind of like it's stressing about stress, right? Uh, very intelligent. Um, but it thinks it doesn't matter what grades. Okay. <laughs> and so not only is the stress and anxiety super challenging, but you're also dealing with like the teenage brain, right? Um, okay. So, all right. I think I understand the question. So while we don't want to teach our kids like that you cannot fail, you cannot mess up, we don't necessarily want to go into the opposite extreme. Like it does nothing matters, you know, you don't have to try. I do find for um, kids who are already kind of you know, struggling with some unrealistic expectation and perfectionist tendencies, usually they don't rubber band all the way to the other side if, you, if you're helping them find middle ground. I do find kids who this hasn't been addressed if they're perfectionists and they're like going striving, 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 they eventually, they hit, they hit like a brick wall and they go the opposite direction. Like, well, nothing's good enough. I'm just giving up. Uh, so I guess to answer your question is I really reinforce the doing your best, right? Even though you're not defined by a great letter grade, a test score, it is going to influence your future, right? Uh, and so encourage them to do the best with what they got, with where they are, is what I always say, is what I try to do. And some days that's going to look different, right? If I just, you know, um, had a stressful family situation or I had a death in the family, my best might look different than it would if that hadn't happened. Uh, and so it kind of helps. It's, it's There's no perfect. And if you think about it as adults, we never find that perfect balance either. We tend to overdo it or underdo it in our effort to find that nice kind of healthy medium. But I think as long as we're trying to find that medium, that kind of balance, we're doing pretty darn good, you know? And I think after the fact, it's like, okay, so did you do, do you do your best, right? Under those circumstances. And if the answer is like, yes, then like, that was awesome. If the answer is no, then that's a whole nother story of like, yes, you know, you do have expectations for, um, you know, doing your best to get you know, past your classes, you know, if that you know, is possible. And if not, then, you know, how can I support you to do better? Yeah. All right. I do think that was a great question. I think we see that a lot um, with our Center Grove students, especially the part about being super intelligent, but not really understanding the purpose of doing things or that fear of not doing as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we really encourage parents and counselors to connect with the students about, okay, what does that look like? And really connect it to their job and responsibilities for now. So yes, you're in ninth grade and your job is to go to school. And part of that is things we don't like to do. And part of that is things we do like to do. And how does that play into futures? Mm -hmm. um, and so we really try to connect it to their future hopes for a career and how does that connect um, as well. And so we see that can be helpful sometimes too of having that conversation, which I'm sure that mother has had that, but I think that has helped us um, really kind of have that conversation with some of our um, higher achieving students that struggle. Another one we hear a lot is they know how to answer the math problem. Why do I have to show my work? And so we have to explain, you know, the learning of that and being able to see if we were to make an error and how to have a growth mindset and to um, shift those errors when we do make them, because we are going to come up across things in the future that we won't know how to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to add to that, Christy, too, is that I, I like to teach a cause and effect kind of approach with the kids of like, okay, so, um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, part of, of, of high school and middle school is, you know, learning, you know, your math, your English, all those sorts of things. Um, but a big part is preparing you for adulthood. Mm -hmm. The big thing is, how do I make myself do the things I really don't feel like doing? Mm -hmm. right? And I tie that into like, so if you're at a job, there's going to be great things that you like about your job, hopefully, but there's going to be 
inevitably things you don't like doing, you know, and as I say, you know, as a therapist, my favorite part is talking to you guys, right? like talking to people. Um, but there's a heck of a lot of paperwork that isn't, I'm not a huge fan of, but I have to do that part to get to do the fun stuff, right? Uh, and so kind of normalizing that for them a little bit of like, okay, yeah, like, ugh, all right, it's an endurance game a little bit. It's preparing me for this is the reason. Um, definitely. We have a second question. It says, how do I handle a teen that tends to self-sabotage in social situations? Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, and without knowing a little, a few more details, you know, um, if a kid is, okay, so my guess with this one is if a kid is, has some social anxiety or is, um, you know, kind of is overthinking, uh, situation, which happens, right, with social anxiety, like, there's a lot of focus on, like, okay, this is what they're thinking, there's a lot of assumptions, how they view me, and so for some kids, they'll be like, screw it, it's just easier to, like, not do it, right, I'm not going to go, or I'm just going to sit in the corner, and I'm not going to talk to anybody, uh, and so I think sometimes there is a little bit of, like, help with desensitizing, right, like, okay, so, all right, you know, we can teach them about the faulty thinking thing, of course, but if you are going to go to, like, a family thing, or you're going to go to, like, you know, a, a pro-social event, you know, whatever that might be um, with other kids. Um, I want you, the goal is to talk to three people, right? Even if it's like, ask them a question, like, where's the bathroom? You know, like make it like uh, a way to kind of a baby step or a bite-sized piece to kind of face the fear um, to get them unstuck. And then over time, those goals can kind of increase, um, but it, they can experience some success from um, at least completing those goals that are, you know, help making them face the fear, face the anxiety, but in a way that it's not like all at once, right? The pressure of like going in and, and doing super well socially and making a bunch of friends and being accepted and all those things get maybe off the table, which they're kind of looking at and like, okay, three people or two people, depending on the situation, I, you know, I, I can say hi to three people, you know, I can ask a question, I can, you know, say, hey, I have that, you know, that's a nice shirt, you know, <laughs> compliment, and kind of like, maybe even role play that with them a little bit. Um, so that would be, that would be my idea on that one. As other questions are coming in, I wonder, Susan, the advice you give around social media, we see that be a trigger for a lot of our students with stress and anxiety. Absolutely. A uh, couple of thoughts on that, that social media um, from my perspective is one, uh, we're talking about like the, the stress chemicals and so forth uh, and feel good chemicals. Uh, the, one of my big concerns and they're kind of finding through studies like it creates what's called a dopamine dump. Right. There's it's a, there's a feel good. There's like immediate gratification if you see someone likes your post or, you know, you see something that's funny and it cycles through so quickly. And if you think about maybe a lot of us as adults, we get sucked in too, right? You're like, you know, it goes so, oh, well, that's interesting. That's interesting. And so it's like it releases some of those that dopamine, which is a feel good chemical um, in our system. So kids get you know used to that being their baseline, like to enjoy things. They need that instant constant gratification uh, and so if you think of a situation which is very common something happens and the consequence is to take your kid's phone and they absolutely lose it right so it seems like at the end of the world is because that's kind of their like lifeline not just to friends but also to those like immediate feel goods they don't know how necessarily to create those feel goods for themselves uh, the other part about social media is you know a lot related to despite the the many things that are out there that are really unhealthy in general is the impact on self-esteem, right? Uh, and I know a lot of people have conversations with their kids about this, but the constantly viewing uh, what they deem as kind of like perfect or having it together um, is, is detrimental, right? Because even though they know like, yeah, not everyone's life is perfect, I get that, but they see people who only put their best forward. They can, I call it the compare and despair, right? Um, my, I don't look that way or um, I, you know, my life isn't, you know, perfect or I'm not happy all the time. The other person isn't easy, but that's not really what they're seeing. And uh, I think there are a lot of kind of things, and I'm I'm not an expert on social media, but I do also think that having some limitations and there are some apps and things that you can 
monitor some of that stuff um, can be really helpful. Not, you know, you might see some things that you can let go, so to speak, but like for dangerous things, because we all know there are some really dangerous aspect, aspects and predators out there uh, and just really unhealthy information. Um, you know, one example with that, of that would be with eating disorders, right? Uh, a lot of our kids struggle with eating disorders and their self-image. And so there are, you know, sites and groups out there that reinforce that and, you know, teach that that is, you know, restricting and losing weight and not eating is healthy for you. Like you should do that. You know, they reinforce that faulty thinking and that behavior. And so, um, you know, definitely have to you know, encourage people to keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. The next question is about reacting and handling kids' anger. Okay. Well, that could be its all its own whole session, quite honestly. That. Yes, it could. Um, but I'll give you a couple pointers, a couple ideas. Again, not knowing specific details. You know, anger is one of those things too that it's a natural human emotion. Uh, it's just how we handle it. It's going to be healthy or unhealthy. And, and your kids are to deal with big feelings, right? Uh, and so I we one have to look at how we are handling our anger, right? If we, you know, do as I say, not as I do, that does not fly really well as kids grow up. They internalize what they see and they learn from that, right? Uh, not that anyone's perfect at that, of course, but if we can model, you know, how we're handling our mood and our frustration uh, and, oh my gosh, raising teenagers is probably the hardest job ever, right? Um, you know, that they're going to see that. Uh, I think that's, you know, teaching them some skills if they're getting frustrated and upset. Hey, um, these are some things that you can do. Uh, it's okay to take a time out. Someone's completely escalated uh, and kind of, you know, losing it, so to speak. Um, you know, there's nothing healthy that's going to come from that, right? They're not going to hear you. Um, or if you're getting really frustrated because you are human, hey, maybe I, I need a break. Like, let's, let's kind of just take a break come back later to kind of discuss it and so forth. Um, you know, I do think, um, and that's kind of like anger that builds up that um, to the point of like, to the point of losing, losing control of like rational thinking. I also think you have to be aware sometimes anger is an attempt to um, push buttons, right? Some kids, um, when they are, <laughs> Uh, not getting what they want, right? Things aren't going their way. Uh, they feel very out of control. And so sometimes uh, trying to push your buttons and oh my goodness, they're probably really good at it, right? Uh, is their last ditch effort to feel in control of the situation. At least, okay, I can't, you know, I'm grounded or whatever, but at least I'm going to get you to respond and kind of lose it a little bit. Cause then I like, I kind of win a little bit. Uh, and so that's, that's hard as a parent to kind of keep your cool in those situations, but that's where that break kind of comes in. Uh, obviously, any dangerous behavior doesn't needs to be addressed, for sure. I did kind of zoom back in on this um, handout because I think some of the relaxation mm -hmm. exercises that you gave could also be used yeah. in that anger. Absolutely. Um, and not knowing the age of that question at our elementary, we use a lot zones of regulation. So we talk about our students and are you in the green zone, the red zone, yellow zone to kind of help them identify those feelings and maybe even identify some of those triggers before they have that anger. So we talk about doing that, um, obviously when they're calm, but if you have specific questions, I would love to help as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so question about the handouts. I think something um, happened and those were not sent to you all. So we will make sure that everybody that was on and registered gets that in addition to if you would like we are going to do um the we are recording so we will post that on our website but you are more than welcome to have that um, but we'll for sure send the three handouts awesome. any other questions for susan why we have her i've appreciated um, learning some different techniques and um, really talking about a topic that is really big and our students, especially in Center Grove. I know you've hit on that a couple of times with um, overachieving academically, extracurriculars. We really have a lot of um, successful kids in our district and we tend to see anxiety and stress being one of those top needs that our school counselors and social workers are seeing with students. And so that does remind me um, for you all as family, if you aren't sure who to reach out to, um, if you call your school and tell them that you'd like to talk to um, the school counselor or the school social worker, they will connect you or you are more than welcome to email myself or Sarah and we can put you in 
um, we can put you in conversations with those people. Any other questions? Oh, that's a great one. Best stress reduction techniques to use in class. All right, I'll give my ideas and then I don't work in the school. So definitely our school folks who maybe back me up or give some other ideas or tell me I'm wrong, I don't know, either way. Um, you know, but I help teach kids because it depends a little bit on the situation, right? That's why I give so many options. I'm a big breath work person, right? So um, like box breathing is a big one therapists teach right now. So it's like an inhale for, hold for four, exhale for, pause for four, right? Or a big one for me, I, it's easy one. I'm a tactile person. So like tracing your hand on the inhale, exhale. You don't have to hold it up like that. I'm just doing that to show. It can be kind of like down in your lap. Um, also, sometimes I have kids have, like they'll take like little things that are soothing for them, like maybe a worry stone, you know, they can kind of rub or, you know, I wear bracelets, you know, that I like have to have beads on them. And like for each one, I can kind of like it helps soothe me to kind of go through each one or, you know, a small item. We don't want to be distracting a class, of course, but something that is like, you know, like a little like figurine or something that kind of helps ground them and brings them back to that moment. Um, from the school side, do you guys have some thoughts or ideas on this one? Yeah, definitely those breathing strategies. We really encourage our teachers um, to practice those with all of their students because we mm -hmm. never know when we might need them. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a great one. We have a lot of kids who do um, like kind of some tapping even mm -hmm. on their fingers or under their desk. Um, we have some students, if they are in elementary and they stay in the same desk, that will use Velcro kind of as a sensory, mm -hmm. um, something that they can rub on. And then in addition to that, sounds simple, but um, all of our classes allow students to bring water. And so them just having that there um, to take a sip of water when they're feeling that stress um, or that worry. And then always really having them know who is a person at school that they can connect with if that stress is really feeling super overwhelming and they need to take a break. So that could be in the front office, that could be a teacher, but having them know that connect point has been really helpful. Um, we've seen that with those stress reduction techniques. Awesome. Good question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another reason I had so many things on there is because time and a place, right? So, mm -hmm. and sometimes kids are maybe even us, we have like one or two go-tos for our coping skills, but they're not always accessible, right? Like if I'm at school or I'm at work, I can't do all of those, right? I can't hug my pet, you know, even though I might want to. Uh, and so those in the moment things and having a variety is, is so important. I'm super, like, I'm glad to hear that you're teaching them in the class to everyone because like we, were, we talked about, stress is a natural human response. We're going to have it. And so it's great for... Uh, uh, even kids who may not, you know, suffer with ongoing like stress and anxiety, they have those tools to be even more successful. Yeah, agree. As we wrap up, it doesn't, I don't know that we have any other questions, um, but feel free if there are any. I just really want to go back to this visual. I loved this. I think that this would be helpful as a parent and even as a kid. I think so many times our kids will say, I have anxiety and they don't even necessarily know what that means. And so really having that visual for them and having that there as a reminder, I think is really important. Um, and as I shared earlier, you know, our school counselors and our school social workers are there to help. But I also know that that sometimes creates anxiety for our, especially our perfectionist students to feel like they have to miss class. So we do have um, on our Center Grove website, some resources for local counselors, if that is something of interest to you. Um, and I know Bella Vista is on there in addition to adult and child and community health, a variety of local community mental health partners uh, that can help support you and your students if this is an area that you would like some additional support in. So we appreciate you all attending. Uh, please feel free to reach out to myself or Sarah. And if you have questions specific for Susan, we will get those to her. Absolutely. Any last parting thoughts to share as we wrap up? All right. Um, I would just, I, well, I want to say I appreciate everyone who came to listen in today. Uh, this is our first time doing this, so I was like, you never know what to expect. Uh, I really appreciate Center Grove partnering with us to provide the, this kind of feedback and support. Uh, and also, if you, guys, if you guys have any ideas of what in the future you would like us to cover, please let us know, right? We have like the next couple kind of planned, but I would love to see this kind of being an ongoing kind of, kind of dialogue and um, would love to hear some of your ideas too. Yeah, I think we got a, 
our next one after the next two, anger. I think that's a great one that we could address. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, enjoy your evening. And thanks again for hopping on. And we will send out the handouts. Have a great night. All right, bye, everyone. Thanks.